Coming off the most successful regular season in franchise history and one of the most dispiriting playoff losses in franchise history, put the Canucks in good company in National Hockey League history. The NHL is littered with more tales of major upsets than any of its professional counterparts in North America. If the trials and tribulations of such an occurrence eventually lead to a Stanley Cup, you enter the pantheon of great champions who used heartbreaks to fuel their breakthroughs. If not, you become part of a much larger group, the one filled with teams that simply missed their opportunities. The Canucks and captain Marcus Nasland were focused squarely on the former. A lot of times you look back and you get judged on how many championships you won. So we knew that we would never be satisfied unless we would win the cup. But first, they had to determine whether or not they had the right pieces. And as analyst Ray Ferraro points out, there was only one particular piece in question. The one thing that always hung around the Canucks, of course, was their goaltending. And how far was their goaltending going to be able to hold up, you know, as the backstop to a very, very good team? Where was the hole? Like, you just didn't really see it, and then you went, oh yeah, it's in goal. The Canucks needed more stops if they wanted to go on a run. And now management had to decide who would make them. We put that team back on the map, man. Like, there were some bleak times there for a while. For that next five or six years, he was the best power forward in the game. There was a confidence that we believed if we went out and played the way we were capable, we could score every shift. Now it's kind of league-wide. I want to come see the West Coast Express, you know, see these guys in action. That line sold tickets. That line cared about the community. That line gave back. We knew that we would never be satisfied unless we would win the cup. Everything. The whole thing. It's like a bad nightmare happened. In a matter of seconds, I mean, lives basically changed forever. Constructing a winning team in the NHL is no easy task, but it pales in comparison to creating a team that can legitimately contend for a championship. Even if you're able to assemble a roster capable of challenging the league's best, so much has to go right in order to reach a Stanley Cup final, let alone win one. Among the many factors are health, luck, and excellent goaltending. General Manager Brian Burke believed two of those three were interconnected when it came to his Canucks, but he needed to know how the players felt. I remember going out for dinner with Nazzy. Well, I used to fly over with Dave Nolan, and we would visit Nazzy and visit our captain wherever we were, and in this case in Sweden. And asking Nazi, I said, look, do I need to get a goalie? Like, we believe in Klutz, but every year he gets hurt in February or March. And then the playoffs begin. He's just coming off an injury, and we can't get him right before the playoffs. Do I need to get a goalie? And he said, Marcus said, and several other players I talked to said, no, we believe in Klutz. He's a guy. We just got to figure out a way to get him healthy. With everyone backing starter Dan Kluche, Burke knew he needed a better backup plan. Though it was very much in vogue to play your starting netminder in 60-plus games a season, not everyone is built to handle that workload and be ready for the playoffs. Burke and the Canucks were pleased with the progress of 22-year-old prospect Alex Ald, who had been called up when Kluche had been injured in the late stages of the previous season. Ald had been impressive in his six starts and had a front-row seat for the Canucks' playoff run. That year against Minnesota, like I ended up dressing every playoff game and backing up, too. And... I remember thinking like this was the start of something both personally for me, but also for the team. Like that was a step. It was like, we got out of the first round. I still remember thinking, you know, okay, I'm going to be on the team next year. And then they pick up Hedberg late in the summer. Personally, I was obviously disappointed, but realized it was still about development and growth. Burke made the decision in late August and acquired veteran Johan Hedberg from Pittsburgh in exchange for a second round draft pick. The 30 year old puck stopper had become an overnight sensation two years earlier when he went from a relatively unknown backup to outdueling Olaf Kolzig and Dominic Hasek in backstopping the Penguins to the Eastern Conference Final. With playoff experience and well over 100 NHL games on his resume, Hedberg appeared to be a reliable option for coach Mark Crawford to deploy throughout the season in order to limit Kluche's workload. Ald would continue his development as the starter for Vancouver's now minor league affiliate, the Manitoba Moose which ironically was the team Hedberg had been playing for when the Penguins found him in 2001. Having solidified the goaltending situation, Burke turned his attention to the business of Todd Bertuzzi. 
The hulking winger was set to earn $3.7 million plus performance bonuses in the final year of his contract. Bertuzzi had finished third in the NHL scoring race in each of the past two seasons, so earning up to an additional $1.8 million in bonuses seemed likely. But even if that were to happen, he'd still be grossly underpaid compared to the league's top power forwards, who are each earning $8 to $9 million that season. I always believe that if you produce and you do good things, then you get rewarded. Marcus was rewarded the year before, I believe, and I thought I was as equal just like Mo was on our team's success. And I just thought that if you produce and you do your job, you get paid and rewarded. In a vacuum, Bertuzzi's rationale makes a lot of sense, especially in a time where contracts could be torn up and replaced with new ones, and there was no limit to spending on salaries. But with the collective bargaining agreement set to expire after that season, owners were expected to push for increased cost certainty in the form of a salary cap. Handing out a big contract with that battle on the horizon wasn't palatable to a lot of owners. So John McCaw wasn't just going to sign a blank check. Dave Nonis was the assistant GM at the time and was negotiating the deal on behalf of the Canucks. There's lots of reasons that they get contentious. You know, the biggest ones are usually always the same, term and money. You have to have the ability to pay it. You know, you have to have the room to pay it. You have to have support from ownership that that's the right thing to do. And it took us a long time to get to that point, that everybody was comfortable with the term and with the money. Bertuzzi's agent Pat Morris declared that negotiations would cease once the season began on October 9th as the two sides struggled to find a resolution. The date came and went, but that didn't stop the media from asking questions. Bertuzzi scored in the Canucks' opening game, but then went through a goal drought, and the inquiring minds wanted to know if not having a new deal was the reason. I think with the contract, the media made it tougher than what I thought it was. It ended up dragging on for way too long. I know there was with ownership and with Brian and all that, but the distraction, I'm not sure, was more media distraction because it was kind of like, well, if they're not going to pay me, then then move me kind of thing. Like, I've done what you guys asked to do and all that kind of stuff. Burke continued to campaign ownership and eventually... McCaw approved a deal worth just under $28 million over the next four seasons. I mean, I made the deal with Todd, and at the time, it made perfect sense and was a good deal, and they had pre-approved it, and then they changed their mind, so that produced a lot of friction with the McCaw family. But, I mean, Tom Bertuzzi was worth every penny we paid him. Todd was not overpaid given what he had done. There's no question about it. You know, it was a lot of money back then for a player, but in terms of his performance, that's what comparables dictated. But when you're getting a contract that big and that many years tied into it, it sometimes takes a little longer to get everybody on board. It really wasn't that, when you say contentious, it wasn't that difficult between us. I, mean, I was doing those contracts and Pat Morris. It was, it was more about getting those final little details, the last few dollars, the last year, everybody uh, agreeing to that. That just took a little longer than maybe it should have, but... At the end of the day, he got a contract that he deserved. With a new contract in his pocket, Bertuzzi was free of distraction, media or otherwise, and the team was as well. Though the actual contract affected only Bertuzzi, the issue itself had loomed over the team to a certain degree, according to head coach Mark Crawford. I think it affected everybody a little bit, you know, as as time's gone on. At the time, we're all saying, no, it doesn't, it doesn't, but it did, for sure. I think it affected Todd, it affected Brian, it affected me. I had already agreed to my contract and Berkey couldn't do it because he was trying to get his done. (laughs) So, you know, there were all sorts of elements in the background and it was unfortunate. But, you know, as coaches and as players, your job is to just have that focus when you come to the rink that nothing else bothers you. And, And that's what we tried to do. Early season results indicated they'd been successful in doing so. But getting Bertuzzi's extension done coincided with a clear uptick in the team's production. After the deal was made public, the Canucks won five straight games and the West Coast Express began to look like itself again, specifically Nasland and Bertuzzi. Given they played on the same line and power play unit, it's not terribly surprising that both might struggle if one of them wasn't dialed in. Their chemistry on the ice was undeniable. However, their close friendship off it was unexpected. Despite two very different personalities, Naslin and Bertuzzi had developed an extremely strong bond over the years, one that reporter Ian McIntyre had been able to watch grow. 
to me, there's always been this fascinating parallel between Marcus Naslin and Todd Bertuzzi in that both came into the NHL with a ton expected of them and failed fairly miserably at their first attempts with their first teams, the Pittsburgh Penguins and New York Islanders. But they came to Vancouver as these immensely talented projects that needed a lot of refinement. But probably the biggest component of that refinement is they individually had to figure out what it is they want to do in the NHL and how to do it consistently. And I think it's that common beginning that they shared that partly led to them becoming such good friends. As partners on the ice, it was kind of a natural, you know, a highly skilled finisher, uh, playmaker in Marcus Naslin, and a highly skilled power forward, a guy who would just play in direct lines and try to go to the net. At least the Canucks were trying to get him to play in direct lines because Todd Bertuzzi loved to circle. But, you know, it was kind of natural. Hey, these two guys could be really good together. But I think part of what made their relationship and probably helped them even more as teammates on the ice was this common background that they shared that allowed them to, I think, see themselves in each other and become very good friends. It didn't start out that way. When Bertuzzi arrived in 1998, Naslin wasn't quite sure what to make of his new teammate. That he was a little bit of a loud mouth. <laughs> I told him that too. But no, not in a bad way. Todd was Todd and, and I wasn't regularly in the lineup. So it took some time for, for me and, and Todd to connect on a personal level. We, we butted head a little bit in the, in the early stages. And while they didn't play together for quite some time, the connection was obvious once they did. Instantly, we found chemistry. When you're the polar opposite, off the ice, there's a, probably a good percentage that you're that way on the ice, too. And I think just overall, how we saw the game was very similar. Even though we acted differently, we just saw the game in the same kind of light. And I think that's what, what created that kind of chemistry. Part of it came, obviously, from the respect we had for one another as players and both being competitive and, and also maybe noticing that we had on-ice chemistry. So that was part of it. The other thing is I think Todd doesn't let his guard down a whole lot. And for some reason, he, he trusted me and, and our, our friendship grew that way. So, yeah, it might seem like the odd couple, but we did hit it off. Yeah, we are polar opposites. He was quiet, didn't really go out much. Very subdued. He went about his business and we kind of gravitated, uh, I would say. His weaknesses were my strength and his strength were my weaknesses. And uh, it just grew beyond that. And as players, both had grown into a place where they and their team were expected to deliver high-end results. They had raised their standards to a level where good was no longer acceptable. People expected great. Crawford understood it and Nasland was eager to embrace it. Now, we weren't the young up-and-coming team. We were now a team that was supposed to be good, that was supposed to win, that was supposed to be a premier team in the league. And I think that's a different feeling than the three previous playoff teams that we had. But you can also turn that around and say that what a special moment to be the first team in franchise history to win a cup in Vancouver. That's a motivating factor. I think we all knew the opportunity we had also, not just the expectations. And everyone else could see it too. Teams like the Red Wings and Avalanche had fallen hard before their ultimate ascensions. And the Canucks had shown reason to believe they could too, according to longtime broadcaster Don Taylor. Very talented teams that have disappointment in the playoffs learn from that disappointment and they go on to great things. Oilers did it. Islanders did it. So I remember thinking to myself at the time, well, that, that you know, it was disappointing against the Red Wings. Probably shouldn't have won that, that series, and they didn't, but they could have. They were up 2 nothing, and then, you know, they squeak one out against the Blues and then lose in real disappointing fashion to the Wild. You'd have to think they'd have learned from all that and that in 4 was going to be their time. But they'd have to wait 82 games to prove it. The Canucks were supposed to be in the playoffs. They'd reached a point where a successful regular season was viewed as a formality. When you win, you're graded on style points. Lose a couple of games in a row, and people scour for a fatal flaw. It's not an easy place for a team or a coach to be in. You want your team playing at a level high enough to build the habits necessary for postseason success, but not so high that there isn't an ability to raise its level come playoffs. 
Crawford fully understood this tipping point, having been through both failure and success when coaching the Avalanche. He knew it was most important to achieve this balance with his star players, and by this point, he'd established a unique relationship with each of them. It was mature with Marcus. It was give and take <laughs> uh, with Todd. And Todd was tough, but Todd was also very responsive. And, you know, you earn your money with how you deal with those types of players. Brendan, he always looked you in the eye and he always gave you something back from whatever input you gave him. It wasn't just, yeah, okay, great, yeah, you know, and walk on. He would always give you something back. And I always appreciated that level of give and take. And Todd, Todd didn't want to be bothered, but he knew that he needed to be pushed. And I think he accepted that, especially in those early years of his career. Though not dominating the way it had the previous season, the West Coast Express was humming along nicely following Bertuzzi's contract extension. Naslin, Bertuzzi, and Morrison had combined for 104 points heading into the Christmas break, and the Canucks had vaulted to the top of the Northwest Division just ahead of Colorado. While the trio still took certain games over, Morrison and Bertuzzi admit they largely viewed the regular season as an arduous prerequisite for what they truly craved. You wanted to get it over with to get back into the playoffs because ultimately that's what you play for. You play for the playoffs and a chance to win the Stanley Cup. But again, we were still a pretty young team overall. You know, our thinking was, well, we're going to be that much more experienced and that much more seasoned for when next year's playoffs roll around. Yeah, I think we had so much inner demons with the playoffs and all that that we now understood that that all we wanted to do was just get to the playoffs and redeem ourselves and get back, that we played a lot of lackluster hockey. Uh, I, I believe at times we thought that it just came too easy. And we underestimated how parity in the league is and how good the players are. We just didn't have that same regular season focus because we just wanted to get back to the playoffs so freaking bad just to prove and shove it up everyone. Dan Cloutier was certainly motivated to do the same. The Canucks starting goalie was having another career year and Crawford seemed to be pacing him properly. Through the first two months of the season, Cloutier was on pace to play 55 games barring injury, his lowest total in three years. But a groin injury sidelined him for just over a week in early December, meaning Hedberg would get a string of consecutive starts. But there were two problems. First, Crawford had publicly called Hedberg terrible after a mid-November overtime loss to the Flyers, and it seemed to have caused a rift between the two. Personal feelings aside, Kluge's injury happened during morning skate on a game day, and the Canucks couldn't get Alex All to Vancouver by puck drop. It meant local university goalie Chris Levesque was thrust into the backup role. He play only in case of an emergency, which nearly occurred when Hedberg collided with a Penguins forward in the first period. Though Hedberg managed to finish the game, he had suffered an injury, meaning Ald would man the crease until Cluche was healthy enough to play. Mark Crawford, I mean, he was somebody that I knew he liked me as a player. While he wasn't exactly the easiest guy on goalies, for whatever reason, he gave me space. He gave me this chance to play, an opportunity, but he was someone I was afraid of. I was afraid to mess up. And that's probably not the best thing looking back, but it, it did bring something out of me. Like, I feel like I played some really good hockey and probably it was the underlying thing. Like, there was an intimidation factor, but I also felt belief from the head coach. And that's that's huge. Though Cluche would return a few days later, Ald remained with the Canucks for the next month and made an excellent impression. He started five times during that span, allowing two goals or less in four of those starts. As the season moved into January, the Canucks announced a three-year contract extension for Crawford. His club and the Avalanche were jockeying for position atop the Northwest Division. Vancouver had a fairly strong month, but Colorado was nearly unbeatable, winning 11 times and picking up points in 15 of 16 outings. Their success was hardly surprising, given the Avalanche had added a pair of future Hall of Famers on low-cost deals to their already stacked lineup, as described by Vancouver forward Brad May. Freya and Solani come over. You got Sackick, Hayduke, and Tangay, and you got Rob Blake on the back end, and other players that are really, really good. And Yeah, we knew. Like, you knew when you were playing those teams because you had to get up for them, because if you weren't at your best, you didn't even stand a chance to even be in the game in the third period for the most part. Having already played three times, the Canucks and Avalanche were scheduled to meet three more times in a three-week span, an in-season series that could very well determine the division. 
Though the Canucks lost one of their top defensemen, Ed Jovanovsky, to a separated shoulder on January 25th, they were more than ready for their first tilt with the Avs on February 16th in Denver. With the game still awaiting its first goal, Naslund reached for a loose puck in the neutral zone and was hit high by Colorado's Steve Moore. Korea, Steve Moore, and Joe Sackett taking a shift again. And Moore just hit Naslund and Brad May went after Moore. Naslund's hurt. I, I don't remember the actual play itself, but I, I remember getting up. And Mike Bernstein, our, our trainer, coming to, to check on me. Um I didn't play the rest of the game and, and had to stay overnight in, in the hospital there. So that was that. It, it wasn't that big a deal. It, it was a, a borderline hit, maybe. Um, but I didn't make a big deal out of it. I, I just wanted to get back playing. I remember everything. Marcus got hit. I was on the ice. I was the one who got a two-minute penalty. The game was tied. It was, I believe it was no no goals, but it was a very close game. I got the penalty on the play that Marcus got knocked out. May went to the penalty box, Naslin to the dressing room. The Canucks skated to an important one nothing win after Daniel Sedin capitalized on an avalanche turnover for the game's only goal. Vancouver had pulled to within four points of the division lead, but that's not what anyone was talking about after the game. And McIntyre was there to document it. And I remember when the hit occurred. Initially, you sort of stunned and even as an observer, you're concerned when a player's down on the ice. And then you see, oh, you know, that's that's Naslet down there. And then, of course, once you see the replay and take a look at the hit and the fact that Naslin was injured, then you know that this is going to be a big thing for Vancouver. And it was. And Mark Crawford was outraged. And his rage was pretty evident with the media post game. But it just mystifies me you know, why this happens in, in this league. You know, they talk about players not having respect for players. How about the officials? Should they not have uh, respect for the league score in the league? But that was a cheap shot uh, by a young kid on a, uh, on a captain, leading scorer in the league, and we get no call. We get no call. Why is there no respect from those referees for the leading scorer in the league? I do not understand that for the life of me. Crawford may have been the most animated of the Canucks, but he wasn't alone in his aggravation. Marcus's teammates were really angry at Steve Moore and Brad May and Todd Bertuzzi and a couple of others expressed those sentiments and they expressed them far too bluntly and far too openly. Bertuzzi was seething in the immediate emotion of seeing his close friend injured on what the Canucks viewed as a dirty hit. He intimated that Moore would have to pay for his transgression within the context of on-ice justice as explained here by color commentator Tom Larshai. First of all, when you take a cheap shot on a star player and an all-star player and a great player, you're going to have to pay the consequences. It's called the code in NHL hockey. But it was May's post-game comment that ended up attracting most of the attention. After the game, I was talking to Ian McIntyre, a very good reporter in, in Vancouver, and we were having a conversation. I was putting my suit on, and we were getting ready to go get in this taxi cab to go see our friend. He asked me, he said, what's going to happen? Because we're playing two more times within the next 10 days or whatever it is. What's going to happen? And we were, at that time, I think we were five or six. And this is important of the timeline, is we are a few points behind Colorado. So we could actually try to bridge that gap and try to finish first in our division because this is like the Battle of the Titans. Anyways, I said to Ian, I said, he asked me if what's going to happen in the next, you know, next game or two with Steve Moore. I said, it looks like we put a bounty on a man's head, Ian. It's exactly what I said. Go back to the movie Slapshot. We both laughed. He said to me when I said it, because this is the banter that you have in a locker room, which is your sanctuary. And he, he laughed. He says, you can't put a bounty on a man's head, right? We've all heard that kind of, that scuttlebutt. I kind of giggled. And I was like, no, seriously, we have to, you know... We got a serious game. To, I don't know. We're playing whoever tomorrow. We got to do this, that, and the other thing. Now he writes it in the paper. It's no problem. It's just a little, little sidebar to the story of this game and whatever. It became much more than a sidebar, however, because the quote that ran in the story read as follows: "There's definitely a bounty on his head," Canucks banger Brad May said. "Clean hit or not, he's our best player, and you respond. It's going to be fun to get him." Most people didn't make the connection to the famous scene from the movie Slapshot, least of all the National Hockey League. It did set a lot of alarm bells off. 
I got a phone call. I talked to the National Hockey League. Like, I'm not Wyatt Earp. I don't put bounties on me. Like, like, this is ridiculous. May assured the NHL his comments were not literal, but the league wanted to cover its bases. The NHL sent memos to both teams in advance of their next meeting on March 3rd, warning both sides there would be severe consequences for any retribution or escalated action. Meanwhile, the Canucks pressed the league to discipline more for taking out one of the top players in the game. The NHL reviewed the hit and felt no discipline was warranted. Yeah, I mean, it was a high hit, but in those days, I mean, it was 50-50 if you're going to get a, get a call. I mean, today, that's a suspendable hit, so it's, it's easy to compare it to, to, to today. But back then, it was not abnormal for a guy to hit another guy like that. Whether that's right or wrong, I'm not saying. But, I mean, I do think there should have been probably more discipline associated with the hit, for sure. Especially, you know, Marcus was our top player. Was there malicious intent on Steve Moore's part? I don't believe so. But at the end of the day, you control your actions ultimately on the ice, and it didn't sit well with our team. We used to tell the league, and this will probably annoy Colin Campbell, but Coley would call me and he'd say, we had a hit last night, we were looking at it, or we don't think we're going to do anything or whatever. And I'd say to him, Coley, don't call me. Don't worry about the Vancouver Canucks or the Anaheim Ducks or whatever team I had. We will look after ourselves. I don't care if you suspend that player. I don't care what you do. We will look after ourselves. And the league doesn't like that because that's self-help and it's not allowed. So on this one here, do I think they could have done something? Yeah. Do I think it was a bad non-call? I think it started a chain of events that was inevitable by not giving them something. I didn't really worry too much about it, actually. I I know that Crawford was very upset and and some of my teammates as well, but... uh, I didn't really look at it that way. I know hockey is a contact sport, and I, I did put myself in a vulnerable position. He took advantage of it, and it, it's unfortunate what happened, but I put my focus on just trying to get back as soon as possible and, yeah, get back to playing. After being diagnosed with a concussion, Naslin missed the next three games and sat out for a week, which was standard NHL protocol at the time. It meant he was back in time for the March 3rd meeting with the Avs. But he wasn't the only high-profile figure in Denver for the rematch. In light of some of the post-game comments, Commissioner Gary Bettman was on hand to send the message that everyone had better behave and play hockey. Both clubs complied as the top line for each team put on a show. Naslund and the West Coast Express put up nine points, while Joe Sackick's hat trick was part of a 10 point night for Colorado's first line. There was but a single fight in the game. No one went after Steve Moore, and neither Bertuzzi nor May were involved in anything that remotely resembled retribution. It was the best game of the year. It was a 5 5 tie in Colorado. Incredible hockey, incredible hockey players. I think I played in the game. I know I, I know I played, but I don't know how much I played because I don't care. But I remember sitting on the bench watching these players play, and it was unreal. Separated by a point and even in games. And now the home ice advantage switches to the Vancouver Canucks for next Monday night's game, Jim. And we can only hope that it is as entertaining as this one was. Fans in Vancouver were hoping for the same as they crammed into GM place for the final meeting of the regular season between these Western powers. The Canucks had a day to rest up after finishing their road trip with a 4 0 shutout win in Columbus while the Avalanche were playing the second half of back-to-back games after getting smoked 7-1 by the Flames the night before. I remember knowing that the Avalanche had gotten beat the night before, and I can remember going in and saying, these guys are going to be so ready because they were awful the night before. And that's what we were warning our players about. It was, these guys are going to be ready. They're going to be ready. And, of course, we wanted to beat them. And I think we wanted to beat them more because we wanted that divisional title. The teams were separated by a single point in the standings. Trevor Linden was on the verge of becoming the Canucks' all-time leading scorer. There was a playoff-like vibe in the building despite it being a Monday night in early March. And personal revenge was the last thing on the mind of Captain Marcus Nasland. I didn't think anything was going to happen. Obviously, guys were upset with Steve Moore, but yeah, not, not more than that. 
Former player turned broadcaster Ray Ferraro was part of the crowd and said something just felt off in the rink that night. It had this weird, it was odd. There was almost like there was something on the horizon and you didn't know what it was. Hell, nobody thought it was going to play out the way it did. Crawford recalls the team finding out about a trade before the game that may have affected the Canucks' mindset. I remember we were in on Zamnoff because we really felt we needed a center. And that night, right before the game, Zamnoff was traded. So we were all kind of disappointed going into that game. And I think that's actually another factor that people may not know that was such a big part of just the mood of the team. Brad May tried to set the tone early by fighting Avs tough guy Peter Worrell, who towered over him at six foot seven and 250 pounds. On the ensuing faceoff, Steve Moore decided to drop the gloves with Canucks winger Matt Cook, who played the game physically but rarely fought. It wasn't much of a scrap, but Moore had engaged in a fight. 18 seconds later, Milan Hayduk opened the scoring to give the Avs an early advantage. Not only were the Canucks unable to muster an immediate response, They looked sloppy and out of sorts. Vancouver was having trouble completing passes, let alone creating scoring opportunities. Colorado would double its lead on a Steve Konowalchuk goal with a little over five minutes left in the opening period. And that's when the wheels fell off for the Canucks. Joe Sackick and Darby Hendrickson scored within 51 seconds of Konowalchuk as Vancouver allowed the three fastest goals in franchise history. Crawford pulled Kluche in favor of Hedberg in order to give his team a spark. But the Canucks were still in a daze. Steve Moore and the onslaught continues as the Avalanche take a 5 to nothing lead and Steve Moore tucked that one in. Over their five previous meetings that season, neither team had led by more than two goals at any time. The Canucks and Avalanche had each scored 12 goals against each other. This first period blowout was a complete shock to everyone, including Jim Hewson, who was calling the game. I remember it as being a bit of a surreal night because something felt weird like right from the start of that game because the, the Canucks were spending way too much time on a guy who was not their main rival on that team. They were two really good teams that should have been playing at a high level, but the Canucks were preoccupied. The game was seemingly out of reach until May scored a pair of goals less than a minute apart before the midway mark of the second period. Linden assisted on both goals, making him the leading scorer in Canucks history. But it was overshadowed by May barking in the face of Avalanche goaltender David Abisher, challenging him to an altercation. May took a penalty but ignited the crowd. Down 5-2 with more than 30 minutes remaining, there was suddenly a belief that perhaps the high-flying Canucks could mount a comeback after all. The game got away from us early. Brad May, who'd gotten a couple of scraps that game, he got us back in the game, I thought, you know. He got us back to 5-2, and we had the two-man advantage going into the third period. But then we got scored on early in the third period, and that's where everything went awry. With the score now 6-2 and any hopes of a miraculous comeback seemingly dashed, there was an uneasiness throughout the building. McIntyre could feel it in the press box. The whole game, there'd been this a sense of anticipation that something's going to happen. And early in the game, Steve Moore agreed to fight Matt Cook and got the jump on him and probably won the fight against Matt Cook. And he felt that by doing that, that he had fulfilled whatever his responsibility was under the code to be accountable. But of course, the Canucks felt otherwise. I think most teams would have felt otherwise, that the perpetrator doesn't necessarily get to pick who is going to handle you know, the accountability. And... There was this feeling like before the game ends, something is going to happen. Ferraro felt the same way in the stands. When Steve Moore fought Matt Cook early in the game, if Matt Cook had laid a number on him, you know, had decisively won the fight, maybe that was it. Like, you know, like maybe the thought would have been the message has been sent, don't touch our captain, we didn't like that play. All of whatever you thought could have been sent might have been wrapped up in that time. If the game was 3 2, There's nothing happening. It was one thing after another. I remember Trevor broke the points record. And I remember when they announced it, it was like, oh, yeah. You know, like it was like an afterthought that should have been a great thing. But it was in the midst of what was becoming this unruly, irretrievable game. Like they could have had five refs out there. There was no way to tame the building back down. There was no way to put the game back on the rails, it felt like. 
The results seemingly secured, Avs coach Tony Granato kept his star players on the bench. Maybe in an effort to protect them from potential injury. Maybe not to blatantly run up the score. It meant more ice time for his third and fourth lines, which included Steve Moore. The Canucks visibly increased their efforts to get Moore to fight. Shift after shift, he declined every invitation. And that's when Bertuzzi took matters into his own hands. Now they're into running time, although Pronger is mixing it up with Steve Moore down in the Colorado zone. They separate. Bertuzzi comes over to have words with Moore. Todd shadowing him, having words with Moore. Keeping right after him. Bertuzzi challenging Moore. Mm, you know what? I don't really don't remember much about a lot of stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. And listen, I thought I want to be very respectful. I no, I know you. I know, no, no, I know you're not being a dick. You just you're allowed to ask a question, and I'm allowed just to kind of say I don't remember. I don't remember a lot for a lot of reasons and a lot of years that that I've kind of moved on my own. Most others will never forget, including Brian Burke, who watched it all unfold from the general manager's box. We started a line change there, so Sean Pronger had come on for Mo, Brendan Morrison, and then Todd was supposed to come off. And so Sean Pronger saw that he was on the ice with Steve Moore, grabbed him, gave him a chance to fight, and he wouldn't fight. And then they start skating off down the ice toward the puck, and that's when Todd started following him and tapping him. So we are yelling at him at first for yelling, change, change, Bert, change. How stupid is this, Scotty? I'm screaming at Todd Bertuzzi in a packed arena, and I'm at the top of the press box like anyone's going to hear me, right? But I'm yelling, chains, chains. And then he starts chasing Steve and tapping him on the shin pad. And now we're yelling, no, no, don't, because we knew something was going to happen. We didn't know what. We didn't know if he was going to punch him or something, but we knew something bad was going to happen. So we're all yelling, no, no, and then, He gets mad and sucker punches him and all hell breaks loose. Morrison was sitting on the Canucks bench. Things like this have happened hundreds of times in hockey over the years. Uh, You know, there's the punch, there's a dog pile, and then you're just kind of, okay, we're going to get a penalty here. You know, we're going to be shorthanded. You're just kind of waiting for everybody to disperse from the pile and get up, and then everybody gets up, but then Morrison still laying on the ice. You're thinking, all right, you know, maybe he's winded or something because of that, everybody that landed on him, right? That's kind of the initial thought I had. And then, you know, he's not really moving a whole lot. He's down on the ice, and then their trainer comes on the ice, and then you're like, geez, maybe this is serious here, right? So then you kind of have a bit of a sick feeling in your stomach, really. Ferraro was amongst the crowd. You know, I've been around enough rinks that when the trainer gets to center ice to where Moore is and puts his fist in the air, like that's the all call. And, like, it felt bad. Like, it just felt bad. McIntyre witnessed it from the press box. If you go back and watch that incident and listen to the crowd, you can hear the bloodlust, this sort of primal, basic reaction when the incident occurs. But within a minute, because obviously there was a big pileup, you know, Brad May was involved with somebody else, And it took a while to unpile, and then there's Steve Moore lying on the ice, unconscious and bleeding, and clearly a lot of concern about his health. Well, the the atmosphere changed dramatically. It's hard to express, if you weren't there, how much the mood changed in an instant. An instant that altered much more than the atmosphere in the arena. In a matter of seconds, I mean, lives basically changed forever, right? Jovanovski had not yet returned to the lineup and was in the dressing room when Bertuzzi first arrived. You know, I wasn't playing that game. Yeah, I remember, you know, watching it, doing rehab or whatever, and the melee breaks out and, you know, Todd comes into the room. He's like, what did I just do? May was on the ice, but never saw the incident itself. I had the puck in the neutral zone and I was going to score my first hat trick in my mind ever in the National Hockey League for me. So I had the puck. I turn dead left and I get in my third fight immediately. And I remember when the fight was happening, I don't know, it was an eerie, like there's something that was weird, but the, of course, I don't know what's going on, Scott, because I'm actually in an altercation, right? I don't know what's over here to the left. The referee was like, please guys, you got to stop. You're in the moment, but we heard this, like we let each other go. He said, thank you. The referee did. 
Now I get kicked out of the game. I had been in my third fight. I'm being escorted off the ice. I haven't seen anything. I walk down the hallway in the locker room, and the first thing I get is a 245, 250 pound man in my arms. And I don't want to go too deep into that, but my buddy and I, my buddy being Todd, we had an embrace that I, I, I would liken it to, I'd been a father for, of two when my children were one, two, three years old with the flu and you hold them. If you have that, you know, that feeling, that hold for probably 10 or 15 minutes in our locker room because the whole spirit of the sport and the game and everything else it was gone. This was serious. This was like very emotional. Yeah, that, that's a moment that I'll never, I'll never forget. It's actually a special moment, but it's my moment and I'll leave it at that. I remember after the game, uh, just going into our video room and he was, he was so distraught and his wife was there with him and, you know, he had, you know, just total, total, total gargantuan remorse. I can remember going to get Brian. I'm saying, Brian, you've got to come in here. He needs you right now. Well, he was sobbing. He, 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 was, he was a wreck. Steve Moore was stretchered off the ice, eventually loaded into an ambulance, and transported to Vancouver General Hospital. He was conscious, but no one knew the extent of his injuries. I'm trying to talk to Todd. He said, I'm going to go to the hospital, because we had heard he'd been taken to the hospital. He said, I'm going to the hospital to see if he's all right. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're not going anywhere near the hospital tonight. We'll get reports on him. We'll find out how he's doing. You go home, we'll sort it out. Then we went from there. No one was sure what to think that night, and most have trouble reconciling the incident to this day. From Nasland? Yeah, it's a surreal moment looking back at really the whole game and and all the stuff that occurred even prior to Todd incident. But it's such an unfortunate moment for everyone involved. Obviously, it's... I didn't want to see Steve Moore getting injured and I didn't want Todd to do anything either because he, he liked me as a as a friend and as a teammate and wanted to stand up for me. Uh, yeah, it was so unfortunate for, for everyone involved. To Morrison. Obviously, there was no intent on our side or Bert's side to cause any harm. It was more of, man, you, you know, had a dirty hit on my line mate my best friend on the team, a guy I hang out with all the time. You know, he missed some games. Like, I'm going to basically stick up for my friend and my teammate, my line mate, and I'm going to get you back. But I'm not trying to hurt you or end your career or anything like that. I mean, that was, like, the absolute last thing. I mean, I, I can't speak for Bert. I mean, to be honest, we've never even talked about it. But, I mean, I just know, I mean, nobody has that feeling of wanting to hurt somebody. To Linden, it was a brutal night. You know, it was just a bad for everybody. I have obviously a ton of empathy for Steve Moore, for Todd, who made a mistake, who was trying to do something, but it was a bad thing. It was just a, it was a shitty deal for everyone. To Crawford. All of us that were there wished that the incident didn't happen. I think all of us felt that maybe we could have done one or two things better. But the situation just happened. And emotions are part of the game. And on that particular night, the emotions got away from from a few. And it is what it is, I guess, is the end result. It was a very, very difficult situation for everybody. And, uh, you know, it, it continues to be something that I don't feel comfortable talking about it. I don't feel comfortable reminiscing about it. It's just a, a sorry game that we wish wouldn't have happened. It was just terrible. It was a terrible ordeal. And then, you know, the days that followed weren't better. Many in the Eastern time zone hadn't seen the incident live, but the hockey world rose early the next day. It was the trade deadline and the networks in Canada were carrying things full time because they were doing their trade deadline shows. So timing is everything. Two national sports networks, each with nine to ten consecutive hours devoted to NHL coverage. It was intended for trade talk, but the fallout from the Bertuzzi-Moore incident took center stage while waiting for deals to materialize. From a hockey standpoint, Bertuzzi had been suspended indefinitely with a hearing to come the day after the deadline. No one knew what the suspension would look like, but with only a few hours left to improve their roster, the Canucks felt they couldn't count on a lenient sentence according to assistant GM Dave Nonis. We knew we had a good team. 
we're losing one of our best players and you just don't replace them within a couple of days. With that said, we felt we had to try to add a couple of pieces to fill the void and, and give us the best chance possible. But when teams are at the deadline and they know that, you know, you've got a, a situation on your hands, you're not getting many people that are throwing you lifelines. And we didn't get many thrown to us. We did the best we could with what we had, added a couple of pieces, but they weren't players that could ever replace Todd Bertuzzi and make that line as effective as it was. Vancouver added speedsters Martin Ruchinski and Jeff Sanderson to their forward group and acquired Mark Bergevin as a depth defenseman, all of them in exchange for either draft picks or prospects. While the hockey world was wheeling and dealing, the rest of North America was reacting to the Bertuzzi Moore incident. It was a slow news day the next day, and that thing got picked up everywhere. Had there been something else, I don't think it would have been quite as spectacular as it became. Crawford's not exaggerating. News outlets were running the story. Debate shows were holding referendums on violence in hockey. The biggest daytime talk show in North America, Oprah, ran footage of the incident and commented on its gruesome nature. The biggest story in hockey had become the biggest story overall. I did an interview one night with Greta Van Susteren from CNN. She was a big star then. She was doing OJ stuff and all that. So it was a national story. Was some of the coverage unfair? Probably, but a lot of it was fair, too. I mean, you're going to have a full spectrum when that happens. People get a chance to be unfair are going to take it, and people who are honest and fair are going to be honest and fair. Bertuzzi flew with Burke to Toronto for his hearing with the league. His team prepared for a home game against Minnesota. Both meetings occurred two days after the incident, and while Bertuzzi wasn't a part of the Canucks' 1-1 draw with the Wild that night, he did return to the arena to deliver the following message. Okay, thank you. I want to thank everybody for joining us on such short notice tonight. Todd is here to make a statement. He flew home today with Brian Burke from Toronto. They arrived back in Vancouver just before 5. Uh, he's had the opportunity tonight just a few minutes ago to visit with his teammates. Neither Todd or Brian will make uh, or answer any questions tonight. Brian will be available tomorrow morning right here at 10 a.m. to uh, answer questions regarding the NHL's decision. Comments for Steve. Steve, I just want to apologize for for what happened out there. But I had no intention on hurting you. But I feel awful for what transpired. Steve's family. Sorry that you have to go through this. And I'm sorry about again what happened out there. He's going to have a full recovery. It means a lot to me to hear those. that's going to happen. I want to apologize to Mr. Burke and Mr. McCaw and the Vancouver Connects organization, and my teammates. and the fans of Vancouver for the kids that watch this game I'm truly sorry I don't play like I don't play the game that way I'm not a mean spirited person and I'm sorry for for what happened The league ruled the next day, delivering its verdict in both a statement and a conference call. Today, the league announced that Vancouver Canucks forward Todd Bertuzzi has been suspended for the remainder of the 2003-2004 season, including the final 12 regular season games, plus the entire 2004 Stanley Cup playoffs. In addition, Mr. Bertuzzi's eligibility for the 2004-2005 NHL season will be determined by Commissioner Bettman, prior to the start of training camp. Ineligible to play another game that season, 
Bertuzzi remained away from his team as it tried to adapt to playing without one of its most dominant players. I wasn't glued in or as focused as you think I would have been. There was just there was a lot going on. And obviously, I'm still part of the Canucks, and I'm one of their loyal teammates and all this kind of stuff. So all I wanted was them was have an opportunity to win and all that. And they fought and clawed as hard as they can. But I'll be honest with you, they were, and that's not being selfish. There was just a lot going on that I wasn't able to be all in as far as watching. You know, no one condoned what happened, but we were still there for him. He was still their teammate. The players regularly contacted Todd, were with him, to try to help him get through it. At the same time, we had to move forward as an organization and try to put the pieces back together so we could be as competitive as we could be down the stretch and into the postseason. The Canucks were four points behind Colorado in the division with 12 games to go, but there was no telling what effect the specter of this event would have on them. Though nine points clear of the cut line for the playoffs, it was fair to wonder if the team would falter down the stretch. You know, one of the most dynamic forwards in the game, that's a big loss. I mean, we still felt that we could make a run for sure. And, and we had good depth on our team and we added some key guys at the deadline. But I don't know if we ever got over it, but it's hard to get past something like that. The Canucks started their playoff push by beating the Oilers in overtime with the newly acquired Sanderson scoring the winner. Vancouver then went winless in its next five games, but the Avalanche failed to extend their four-point cushion. After not having to worry about who was on his top line for over two years, Crawford was now tinkering with his forward group in an effort to find the correct combination. With six games to go, he gave Mad Cook a shot with Morrison and Nasland, and it worked. Cook scored the only goal in a 1-0 shutout over LA and sparked a winning streak. The Canucks ran the table over their final six games, and on the final day of the season, did what they were supposed to do a year earlier. They won their final game at home and edged out the Avalanche to win the division title. It set up a first-round matchup with the Calgary Flames. The two clubs had a memorable playoff history, but hadn't met since the Canucks upset the Flames in the first round of their run to the Cup final in 94. It was a great matchup, that series. and It was an especially terrific matchup between Matthias Olin and Jerome McGinley. And Jerome McGinley was one of the premier players in the league, and Ole was so unheralded but we knew how good he was and you know we wanted him out there every time and that was such a great battle those two. Iginla had tied for the league leading goals with 41 but it was Oland who scored in the opener as part of a 5-3 Canucks win at GM Place. Calgary's captain would respond with his first of the series in game two as the Flames skated to a narrow 2-1 victory in Vancouver. The series now back in Calgary Naslin scored for the second straight game and Morrison set up Cook for the game winner as the Canucks countered with a 2-1 road win of their own in regaining the series lead. But the real story of Game 3 was Kluche, who exited in the final minute of the first period. Hedberg stopped 19 of 20 shots in relief and was suddenly the goalie of record for Vancouver, as Kluche's ankle injury would keep him out for the balance of the series. Canucks fans hoped Hedberg would find the form that helped him lead the Penguins to the third round three years earlier. He made 28 saves in Game 4, but it wasn't nearly enough as the Flames cruised to a 4-0 win. Down to a best-of-three series, Crawford decided to throw a change-up Calgary's way and tabbed Alex Ald as his starter in Game 5. It went from being this guy in the press box eating popcorn, hanging out with the Black Aces and going out for a couple beers the night before a game, to all of a sudden being like, oh, by the way, like you're going to be playing tonight. And I think for sure, hey, like they're going to go back with Hedberg for game five, I guess it is. And morning skate, I come to the rink and it was after morning skate, Ian Clark says, Hey, Crow wants to see you in his office. And I go in there and he's like, you're going to play tonight, but you can't tell anyone. It's like, I'm this secret weapon. They're going to wheel out for warm up and all of a sudden like surprise everyone with, right? Ald played well in his first playoff start, but Mika Kiprasov stole the show in the Calgary crease. Kiprasov made 32 saves, and Aginla's third goal in five games proved to be the difference in a 2-1 win that gave the Flames their first lead of the series, and a chance to close it out on home ice. Crawford stuck with Ald in Game 6, and as Morrison describes, the Canucks provided him a big cushion to work with. We're up 4 nothing, completely dominating the game, like, all over Calgary. You know, when you're up 4 nothing, no one's saying it on the bench, but you're like, right on, man, we're going home. Game 7 at home exactly where we want to be again. Everything's good. Midway through the second period, we're up 4 nothing, and we are absolutely 
cruising, like facing elimination on the road and we showed up and then Calgary starts this wave, they're coming back. And I, I mean, looking back now, I feel like, it feels like it was like four or five whole goals. Like everything was getting tipped back in shots from the point. And I still remember four, one, not a big deal Four two, the dome gets louder and louder at four, four. I remember that is the loudest noise I've ever felt. Like my whole body, the whole building, everything was shaking with the noise and the, you know, everyone pounding on the bleachers and everything. The flames that come down from the ceiling in Calgary, that heat's getting hotter and hotter. Now the game's 4-4 and you're basically, you're hanging on for dear life. Like, hey, let's just get this into overtime. So we do, we get into overtime. And the thing with overtime is, well, I mean, our season's on the line now. I mean, shit. I mean, we get score on, we go home. They call it sudden death overtime for a reason. It would either mean exactly that for the Canucks season or the exact opposite in keeping them alive in the series. Neither team could light the lamp in the first overtime period, and they were off to double overtime with Calgary on a power play. Vancouver killed off Olin's holding penalty, and the game remained deadlocked at four through a second extra session. Knowing the consequences of the next goal, no one wanted to take a big chance in fear of making a major mistake. Despite their season teetering on the brink, Naslin says the Canucks weren't acting nervous. Yeah, I remember it being a very long, long game and we needed to win it. But there was a calmness in our group and for some reason we didn't panic. Well, we go on in the first overtime. We go on in the second overtime. Now guys are getting fatigued and shifts are getting shorter and all this. But I remember sitting on the bench, man. It was weird. Like I was kind of in a good space in my head. I'm like, you know what? Like I feel really good tonight and, and I felt good all game. My energy still feels good. And this is why you work so hard in the summer. This is why you put in all that extra time. This is why you push yourself, you know, quietly trying to convince yourself that you can go out there and be the guy. You never know if it's going to happen, but you got to try and tell yourself that. Nazan gets the puck in the right wing corner. Nice pass to Morrison, cutting in front. Morrison, deeks, shoots, scores! Brendan Morrison in triple overtime. There will be a game seven as the Canucks knock off Calgary 5-4. to four. Morrison has never scored a bigger one than this. You know, when the puck went in the net, I remember just dropping to my knees. It was more out of just relief than anything, knowing that you know we were going to play another game and, and have a chance at home against her in Game 7. Vancouver was electric for Game 7 as the Canucks looked to punch their ticket to Round 2 for the second time in as many years. Having been through both the high and low of Game 7 the year previous, the Canucks were convinced their experience would pay off against the Flames. Linden had been a part of a Game 7 victory over Calgary 10 years earlier en route to the Stanley Cup Final. He'd seen Pavel Bure take that game over, and he was witnessing another primetime performance a decade later. Jerome McGinley was, he was just so good, and that was at his peak of his career, and he was just unstoppable. You talk about Todd and the physicality and the ability, and you know Jerome had all that, and he was just on top of his game. He was unstoppable. Aginla opened the scoring in the second as the Flames drew first blood. Cook countered early in the third before Aginla's fifth goal of the series restored the Flames' advantage with less than 10 minutes to play. A desperate Canucks contingent threw everything it could at the Calgary crease, but Kiprasov was unflappable. In the final minute of play, Jovanovski barged his way to the front of the Flames' net in search of the equalizer and took a high-sticking penalty in the process. Only seconds remained in the Canucks season as Morrison lined up for a face-off in the neutral zone. Conroy gets possession of the puck off the draw, feeds up to Aguila, looking for the hat trick on the backhand. He sends it towards the goal and he missed as it went off the side of the net. There's a jersey been thrown off the ice now. The referee picks it up and the Canucks are able to move up the ice. Aguila fell down. Nazan carries it on the left wing. Goes wide on Leopold. Nazan cutting in front. Backhander stop. Cook scores. Back Cook. He's done it again. Cook ties the game with 5.7 seconds remaining. Who says prayer does not work? When Matt Cook scored shorthanded it, to tie the game with just seconds to go, and Joe Manowski was in the penalty box, and he was jumping up and down. I can still see him, his hands up in the air, pounding the glass and everything else, and it was bedlam. It was unbelievable, the reaction, a sellout crowd going crazy. Cook had scored the goal, but as Tom Larshide describes, the image of Jovanovski celebrating in the sin bin captured the feeling perfectly. It was as though the hockey gods had deemed the Canucks worthy of more. It was only a matter of who would be the hero in overtime as a win seemed preordained. 
to go through the series of events, it's like Marcus gets the puck behind the net. He starts coming up the ice. If you watch the video, somebody throws a jersey on the ice. And then Iggy standing at the blue line. I actually slash Iggy's stick out of his hands. Now he doesn't have a stick, and he's got his hands up in the air. And meanwhile, Nazi's racing down the left wing, and, you know, we're just kind of going to the net. He throws it at the net. Cookie scores are like, what, three point something seconds left? I'm like, what? Oh, my God. And you just think right away in your head, it's meant to be, right? It's just meant to be. Like, these things just don't happen for any reason. Like, this is meant to be. So we go in the locker room, obviously, just wired. And I think everyone had that same thinking. Like, this is our game. There's no way we're losing this game. In the hysteria of the moment, it was easy to forget that Calgary entered overtime on the power play. Here's Aginla on the left wing, cutting in front. Aginla, CL, shoot, stop, rebound. Aginla, rob, they score on the second rebound. Calgary has won it. Mark Tangelina put it home a minute 25 into overtime, and Calgary's moving on to face the Detroit Red Wings. And like that, their season was over. It had been remarkable and unforgettable in so many different ways, but it had ended in much the same manner as the seasons that preceded it. For the third time in as many years, the Canucks were left wondering what might have been. They'd lost a dominant player, yet won their division with a second straight season of more than 100 points. They'd lost their starting goalie, yet very nearly won a sensational series against a team that would come within a game of winning the Cup. While change is inevitable in professional sports... How much change was necessary? Brian Burke wouldn't get to make that decision. Despite months of speculation, he had not been offered a contract extension, and both he and Dave Nonis knew what that meant. We had meetings after the year concluded, and we were summoned, is probably the best way of putting it, to meet with ownership. We did it separately, you know, and we went over what we thought of the team, what we thought of our situation that we were in with with Todd, the direction going forward. And it was a different type of a year-end meeting than I've ever had with an owner. And, you know, at the end of that meeting, I talked to Brian and I said, one of us isn't back here next year. <laughs> so it was it was clear that they wanted to, to make a change of some sort and it turned out that they were going to let Brian go and, and make me the manager. The makeup of Vancouver's ownership had changed back in November. The Aquilini family had purchased GM Place and 50% of the Canucks from John McCaw. Fans applauded the move at the time, preferring local ownership to Seattle-based McCaw, who had been labeled an absentee owner. But Burke doesn't believe the change up top altered his fortune. He believes it was a direct result of how he handled Bertuzzi's contract extension at the start of the season. It probably cost me my job. The perception with ownership that I had overstepped my authority and that I wasn't a team player... So after reconstructing the team and the fan base, Burke was out after six years on the job. He'd taken the Canucks from the bottom of the West to near the top of the conference, albeit without much success in the playoffs. He'd more than doubled the season ticket base, which now boasted a wait list, and the Canucks had sold out 86 straight games at the time of his departure. I listened to the uh, radio this morning and Frosty, who I've only met once in my life in 11 years working here, and he is a pain in the ass. But he was making fun of, uh, of of people in hockey who cry. So I said, told my wife, I'm going to try not to cry. But I do feel uh, very fortunate to have gotten six years in this marketplace in this city that I love. I am very proud of what I built here. I'm very proud of what I leave here. Nonis took over the team in May and promptly signed the assistant coaches to contract extensions. But that was the easy part. With the threat of an NHL lockout looming, No one knew when hockey would be back. No one knew when Bertuzzi would be back. And when he was, what kind of player would he be? Coming up on the next episode of Unreal West Coast Express. Todd wasn't the same player. It couldn't be the same player. So no, it was was different. You walk a tight rope in life now. You're scrutinized for anything that you do. And it seemed like no matter what, at some point, whatever city we were in, they would always seem to come back to, you know, that incident. We had to answer every question other than hockey questions, and I think it just became overwhelming. The general feeling and the the focus was not solely on 
looking at how do we win the cup. You know, in that year, I thought that the rule changes really helped the Sedins. They were coming into their own. They were taking over as the premier group. We always looked up to the older players and the better players, and we wanted to not beat them, but we wanted to beat those guys and be, become better than those guys. And to see them do it every night, we understood what it took. Unreal West Coast Express is a production of Toolkit Content in collaboration with Go Goat Sports. Audio production is by Andre Deacon. Writing and narration is by me, Scott Rentoul. Podcast supervision comes from Aaron Johnson. NHL game audio courtesy of the National Hockey League. Special thanks to the following NHL personnel. Hannah Riedenauer, Matthew Maniker, Teresa Wiltshire, and Nick Martinez.